Hi everyone. Sorry for being a bit late. I was talking with Nate about backdrop and the fact that you really love Symphony, uh, which is a cool news for me. So, um, so today I want to talk a bit about Symphony. I'm, this is not a very technical talk. Um, I, I want instead I want to talk about the problems Symphony tries to solve and why I think that Drupal actually took the right decision when uh, Dries and many other uh, core developers decided to reuse some of our work. And at the end, I'm going to talk about my tech on Drupal 8 and, and the backdrop thing and, and what I think uh, the community should do. Okay, so first, what is uh, Symfony and where does it come from? So I started to work on Symfony seven years ago. At that time, I was working for a web agency I created uh, almost 15 years ago. And it was really created to uh, solve problems for our customers. Uh, so that was seven years ago, and three years ago, I decided to start from scratch um, and, and, um, and start working on Symfony version 2. Um, and I had several goals in mind. The first goal was to be useful com for companies uh, wanting to create um, custom solutions for their projects, but I also wanted to create the best platform possible uh, to build other open source projects. So the main asset of Symfony is a set of components. Uh, we have about 30 plus uh, PHP components nowadays, and each component tries to solve a common web development problem that you can face when creating a website. Um, it's really just about the low-level architecture of a website. We are not um, giving you any business logic. Uh, we are not trying to solve business logic problems, so we don't have any CMS components um, or CRM stuff or whatever. It's really just about and the low-level architecture of what you can do with PHP. And it's kind of interesting to understand that those components borrow a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of best practices, um, concepts, and design patterns from other languages like Python, Ruby, and even Java, and also from other uh, technologies and other frameworks like Django in, in Python, um, Spring in Java, and a few more. So, it's not, Symfony is not a new way of doing things. It's not um, something that you need to learn because of Symfony. Symfony is just an implementation of some other best practices, other design patterns that already exist, and stuff that uh, really work on other um, technologies. So we adapted those techniques to uh, the PHP world, of course. So here is the full list of the uh, uh, Symfony components. Um, and again, it's, it's really just about the, the boring stuff. Uh, how to write a console application, how to read a YAML file, how to write a YAML file, how to uh, translate stuff, um, how to use internationalization, and so on. I'm not going to talk about all of them, I'm going to talk about a few of them. So, some of the components are tools, and basically, each of them uh, does only one task. It solves one simple problem, and that's all. And they don't have any external dependencies. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is the Finder. So the Finder, com I'm not going to talk about how to install the components, because nowadays with Composer, it's really easy. Uh, just add uh, symphony slash Finder to your composer.json file, and, and you're done. Um, so the finder is a way to be able to find files and directories on the file system or uh, online. So it also works uh, with um, Amazon F3, it works with FTP servers, whatever. Whenever you can uh, store files and, and, and directories, you can use the finder to get them back. And you can filter the result um, by date, by name, by size. Um, or you can even use uh, an anonymous function to implement your own logic uh, to filter the, the, the files you want. The second one is the CSS selector. This, this one is quite interesting if um, you are writing tests, functional tests for your uh, website. Um, so you get a URL and you get back an HTML page and you need to check that the HTML page, page is uh, behaving the right way, that the content is actually the right one, 
Um, and the way you can do that by default, you can use uh, regular expressions, but that's quite limiting, and it's not really easy to adapt if uh, you know, the, the design um, changes over time. You can use XPath. That's the default way uh, of doing that with HTML or XML documents, really. Or you can use CSS selectors. And I think that you know, most of you probably knows about CSS selectors, and it's much easier to write a, a CSS selector than it is to write um, an XPath uh, expression. So the goal of this component is to take a CSS selector and to convert it to um, an XPath expression. So the API, is the API is really simple. We only have one method, which is the two XPath uh, one. So that's very useful if you want to uh, do some functional testing, and I'm going to show you an example later on. The debug component provides tools to uh, actually ease the debugging of PHP code. Um, and again, it's really easy to use. You just have to call this method, enable, somewhere in your code, and then um, it automatically register an error handler and an exception handler. Uh, and whenever there is a PHP error or a PHP exception, it tries to give you um, better exceptions than the default of um, the PHP defaults. So this is an example. It's quite small. Um, but uh, the idea is that beside the exception message or the um, error message, it gives you a stack trace. And you can even configure the component uh, so that you can click on uh, the file names and automatically open your um, favorite editor or IDE. Um, and it also tries to be smarter than PHP uh, when it comes to error messages. So this one is about, yeah, so you try to um, load the class finder uh, from the global namespace. So apparently you um, forgot to use a use statement because this is um, a class that is in a specific namespace. So instead of just trying, I'm not able to get the finder class, it tells you that you uh, forgot to uh, add a use statement, and it also tells you that you probably want to use Symfony Component Finder Finder. So we try to help you uh, as much as possible when there is an error. The ENTL component is, is a very boring one, really, uh, but very useful. So you know that in PHP, by default, there is an ENTL um, module uh, that helps with internationalization of your website. But unfortunately, a lot of um, PHP packages um, on different Linux um, versions, they don't provide ENTL by default. And uh, in this case, you can uh, use the ENTL Symfony component, which is a replacement, a PHP replacement for the C extension. And if you are using Composer, you have nothing to do. It will be automatically activated if uh, the PHP extension is not there. It does a bit more than that because it also exposes a lot of information from um, the ICU library. So you can get uh, languages, region, currencies, and a lot more information about um, uh, stuff that are available in the ICU library. So that's about uh, the components. Uh, the tools uh, we have in the components. Uh, so each tool does just one job. It's easy to integrate um, a tool in your project, and most of the time the API is just about one uh, method, one class and one method. So we have tools. We also have um, some frameworks, and those frameworks are more involving because they are doing more than just one thing. Um, but the benefits are also um, higher because if you are using them, then you are able to share code. Uh, you, can, you, 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 are, you will probably uh, be able to integrate more features um, faster. And it's also a great way to be interoperable with other projects that are also using the same components. Uh, I'm going to talk about one uh, HTTP kernel later on. OK. so. Symfony is a set of components that you can use for a project. It's also a full stack framework um, um, that you can use to create a custom application. And Drupal, Drupal version 8, is not using the full stack framework. It's using the components to build a framework on top of the Symfony component. Last but not least, Symfony is open source like um, 
Drupal, it's using the, the MIT license, um, which is very permissive, so basically you can do whatever you want, you can integrate uh, Symfony uh, in any kind of projects, even projects using the GPL license, like Drupal. I like to think of Symfony as being a middleware for PHP applications, an object-oriented middleware for, for PHP, and that's the key point. Um, you know, even if PHP uh, gives you all the tools to create object-oriented code, its core is still mainly done with uh, plain functions, right? You have a bunch of functions. And if you have a look at all the classes provided by the PHP core, they are not web-related. Right, they are not related to the web. So Symfony is a layer on top of PHP uh, to provide an object-oriented um, abstraction for everything related to PHP, to, to the web, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so the first framework I want to talk about is HTTP Foundation, which is um, an abstraction on top of the HTTP specification. Um, and of course, as web developers, you are all using HTTP. You are using HTTP all the time. And Symfony tries to leverage HTTP as much as possible. So <clears throat> how do you represent a request? This is a typical request um, here on the screen. Um, as you can see, HTTP is a plain text protocol. Here I want to get the foo.html resource. I want to use HTTP version. Uh, 1.1, and the host is example.com, pretty simple. And how do you represent this request in uh, PHP? Like this. You don't really represent a request, you just get information by calling functions, like, you know, uh, session start to be able to get stuff from the session, uh, and it's mainly about global variables, right? Um, and that works really well. You can get stuff from the query string, uh, from a post, you can get the method of the, of the, of the uh, request, and so on. But the thing is, it, that's only a very low level abstraction. And here is an example. Uh, if you want to get the client IP address, you can get the remote uh, underscore uh, DDR um, item from the server global variable, right? That's how you can do that. The problem is that it's not secure. This information is coming from, um, uh, from um, uh, the request, so if you want to get the real IP address from uh, the client, because you know, uh, between the client and the server, you can have proxies. You can have proxies uh, um, uh, installed by an ISP, you can have reverse proxies. So if you want to get the real client IP address by taking into account all those proxies, the code is more complex. This is what you need to write. Um, and actually, this is really a, a stripped down version of what you need to write to get the real IP address of the client. And the code is not even secure. Um, if, you want, if you want to get the real IP address or uh, the best approximation for uh, the IP address of the client, you need to uh, know which reverse proxy you are actually trusting, right? You can't you cannot blindly trust all the reverse proxy along the way. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, by default, PHP provides a very low-level um, low level abstraction on top of the HTTP request message. And if you want to get the code right, then you need to write a lot of boilerplate code. So why not sharing this code in one uh, abstraction? So using plain PHP um, is just a pain. First, uh, because it's not object-oriented. And the fact that it's not object-oriented um, has a lot of, you know, consequences, really. Uh, and the first one is that it acts as a singleton. A singleton being, you know, something that you can have just one instance of. Um, it means that if you want to test, if you want to functionally test your website, you only have, you know, one request. You can't have more than one request in one PHP process. And that's a problem when you want to simulate a request for testing. Uh, so this is a big limitation. And of course, you can easily override the underscore get or the underscore post global variables. That's no big deal. But when it comes to overriding the underscore server global variable, that's get really uh, difficult. So that's a lot of our abstraction only. I've talked about that before. Um, um, and and, and, and that's, that's a, a very big problem if you, are, if you want to create secure applications. 
Okay, if we have a look at uh, how you can do the, the exact same thing with uh, Symfony. Uh, so in Symfony, you can create a request from the global variables. This is the first, the second line here. Or you can simulate any request by calling the create method on the request object. So um, here I want to simulate a get slash hello.html request. Uh, I don't care about uh, the values uh, coming from uh, the global variables. And you can even be compatible with the code that um, is still using uh, the old way by overriding the global variables. And Symfony is going to override all the uh, underscore get, underscore post, and underscore server based on the information you uh, gave to it with the create method here. And then you have, you know, the request class exposes all the information that are um, uh, useful from the HTTP request uh, in a semantic and secure way. So when, you, when we get the client IP, you will get back the real um, user client IP address. And of course you can trust some proxies uh, to get a better approximation of the real IP address. And the same goes for the response. Again, um, the HTTP response is um, um, plain text, so it's kind of easy to understand. Here we say that we, we um, answered with an HTTP 1.1 uh, message. 200 means that the response is okay, we have a bunch of headers, and then we have the payload, the body, what is going to be displayed in the browser. And PHP gives you uh, methods to be able to generate a response, uh, to generate headers, to set cookies, and if you want to add something to the payload, you just call echo or print. Right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so, like for the request, um, PHP works um, in a way that you can only generate one response. You cannot generate more than one response in a single PHP process. Which, you know, most of the time, that's fine. But when we are talking about testing your application, if you want to simulate more than one request in a PHP process, then that doesn't work that well. So it makes testing more difficult than it should be. Um, so, singleton-like, again, uh, low-level abstraction only. Um, and it doesn't work on, on the command line, it doesn't play well with, with the command line interface because um, by default, PHP assumes that if you are on the command line, uh, it probably means that you are not um, dealing with a request and you are not going to generate a response, which means that, for instance, in, in PHP, there is a function named um, headers underscore list, which returns uh, a list of headers that you set in your script. Except that if you do that on the console, it will always return an empty array, which is a shame. Right? Um, and if you want to get the HTTP status code that you set in response, um, it's just not possible on the command line. I mean, it's not, it, 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 it has become possible as of um, PHP 5.4, thanks to a new HTTP underscore response underscore code function. So, um, and last but not least, it's not object oriented, but I think it's, that's the least important stuff. The fact that Symfony provides an object oriented way of creating a response is just uh, a nice um, consequence of what we want to be able to achieve with a response. The fact that we want to be able to have more than one response. So, as you might have guessed, we have this response class. Uh, you can create a response. Uh, the first argument of the response uh, constructor is uh, the body, then you have the status code, and then uh, an array of uh, headers, right? And then you can send, um, set the content and send the response back uh, to the browser. And of course, you can only call send once, but you can introspect the response whenever you want. We also uh, support stream responses because that's one thing that PHP does really well as you can use just headers and header calls and echo. Uh, by default, PHP is able to stream the response back to the browser. When you are using uh, an object, that's not really possible anymore because you create the object, you populate the object with uh, headers and the content, and at some point, you need to send the request. The stream response class is a way to um, be able to stream a response back uh, without um, creating a response first. 
Uh, so the request and the response object are totally independent. You can use just the request, you can use just the response, but if you are using both of them, then um, you must know that you know in the HTTP specification, there are a lot of stuff that, um, 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 yeah, sorry. So creating a response sometimes depends on the request. For instance, if you want, if you don't get a resource, but if you uh, want to get the head of the request, then the body should be empty. And the prepare method does exactly that. It checks the request headers, and depending on the values of the, those headers, it tweaks the response so that it actually um, uh, respects uh, the HTTP specification. So, to sum up, the HTTP foundation component uh, abstracts the HTTP messages and gives you um, a f uh, an object-oriented layer um, that allows you to uh, test things more easily uh, and gives you access to more secure um, uh, code. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is innovation. So, Symfony tries to innovate a lot in the PHP world. Uh, we were the first to actually uh, introduce a dependency injection container in the PHP world. Sorry about that. Um, but we also have a lot of debugging tools, and we were the first to uh, add what we call a web debug toolbar. Uh, and basically, when you are in the development environment, uh, you have access on all HTML pages at the bottom of the page. You have this toolbar, and it gives you a lot of information about the current request um, and how it behaves. Um, and uh, nowadays, all the major frameworks are, um, also have the same kind of uh, tool. The interesting thing is that you can also click on each of the item here, and you get into what we call the web profiler. And the web profiler gives you a lot of information about the request, about the response, and uh, what happened during the, the handling of the request. Um, and this tool um, will be available in Drupal 8. Uh, I have a small module integrating uh, this web profiler and the web debug toolbar into Drupal 8. Uh, it's not, I, I, I did the work uh, probably six months ago, so it doesn't work anymore for uh, the current version of Drupal 8, but it should be easier nowadays to integrate that than it was six months ago. So that's something that you will, we will be able to share uh, with you. Um, another game changer for me is Twig. Uh, I call it a real templating system because you know I think that PHP is not really uh, a very good um, PHP templating system. Not going to talk about that today because I already talked about that yesterday. Um, and nowadays, nowadays there are so many other uh, projects that are using or switching to Twig that uh, uh, you know if you learn Twig, um, you will be able to use this knowledge with many other different. Uh, project, even project not written in PHP, because the syntax itself, the language itself, is shared with uh, other uh, libraries that you can find in Ruby and, and Python. So the syntax itself is um, becoming a standard, really. Okay, uh, I need to talk about dependency injection. I'm not going to uh, dive deep into what dependency injection is or what a dependency injection container is. Um, when I was working on Symfony version 2, uh, the very first prototypes, I had a bunch of problems, and one of them was how can I make things more uh, flexible? How can we allow people to uh, remove some parts and replace them with other ones? Uh, it was kind of important to be able to decouple all the components that we had to be sure that you can use just one component or the other one without any interaction. And if you get them together, they can interact in uh, various ways. Um, so, dependency injection, I think that this design pattern is probably one of the easiest to understand. Um, the name of the pattern is kind of scary, uh, but it's really easy to understand if you know uh, what object-oriented programming is. The container is not something that you really need to be aware of most of the time. Uh, this is really the lullaby stuff. 
um, and, and you will probably never interact with uh, the container directly in Drupal 8. If you need to interact with uh, the, the dependency injection container in Drupal 8 for day-to-day -day activities, it means that there is something wrong somewhere and, and that needs to be fixed. Um, so as you, yeah, you might have guessed that Drupal 8 is going to use the Symfony container. Uh, if we have a look at the community, um, uh, so Symfony, um, we have about 850 uh, core developers, uh, which is a lot for a PHP project, uh, but nothing if we compare to uh, Drupal. I think you have almost twice uh, as um, uh, twice uh, this number for uh, Drupal 8 uh, nowadays. So still, that's a lot. Um, we have a very active community. Uh, we, uh, the community created more than 2,000 bundles in the last year and a half, so that's, that's really a lot. Um, and um, we have almost one million downloads every uh, single month. So that's a very big project, really. The last thing I want to say about uh, Symfony um, is that, you know, Symfony is not a black box. Um, it is just plain PHP code. Code that you can probably read, that you can probably understand. Um, but most important, the Symfony code is just about implementing best practices and design patterns and standards, really, like HTTP. Um, uh, it means that if you want to learn Symfony, it's more about learning those standards, those best practices, uh, and, and less about learning something specific to Symfony or the implementation details of the Symfony code. Most of the concepts that you are going to learn um, are really concepts that are not tied to Symfony. So if you already know about these standards, like HTTP, dependency injection, uh, learning Symfony is really easy. And if not, then well, you will, have, you will be able to uh, apply your new knowledge to um, other, in other technology, uh, technologies or even in other languages. So that was about Symfony, what it is, um, and, and why I think this is a good idea to uh, reuse some of the components that we have. But now, is Symfony good for your open source project? Um, so as I said before, it was one of my goals to be able to provide a platform that is a good uh, tool uh, for other open source projects. So I'm very happy that it actually happened. For me, there are four key points. The first one is Symfony allows you to standardize uh, your low-level architecture. So let Symfony do uh, the boring stuff. Uh, there is no need to reinvent the wheel here. There is no need to reinvent a new way to abstract the request, to abstract a response, or stuff like that. So that if you spend less time on this low-level architecture, it means that you will have more time to focus on um, the core features that you need, that your users need, uh, all the business logic that you can implement for your users, uh, like the mobile, HTML5, uh, WYSIWYGAD, or whatever. Um, things that will make Drupal a great tool for new uh, users. Um, and I think that, you know, Symfony is just an implementation detail. Then, if you are using Symfony, it means that it will be easier to integrate with other products also using Symfony. And we are working out trying to convince other open source projects to actually adopt some of the Symfony components so that um, we, are, we, we, we will be able to have a more interoperable PHP platform for everyone. Uh, and also, because more people will be able to understand your code, you will have a larger pool of developers um, uh, helping you with, with, with the code. Also because we don't have a CMS in the Symfony world anyway. Um, so, interoperability and, and integration is possible because Drupal is not the only project uh, using um, Symfony. There are many other different projects. Um, I've just... Um, so this slide is just about a few of them, the, the main ones probably. 
so we have big projects, we have small projects, we have uh, CRM systems, we have CMSs, we have uh, RRM tools, we also have other frameworks using some of the Symfony components. So uh, a lot of different uh, kind of uh, projects. Drupal is not using all the Symfony components, but quite a few of them really. And um, the last one I want to talk about today is HTTP kernel because this is probably the most important Symfony component that we have. And this is um, because of HTTP kernel that uh, projects using uh, Symfony are interoperable actually. So I like to think of HTTP kernel as being um, the equivalent of FRAC in the Ruby world or WSGI in the Python world. Um, I mean, it's, if it's not exactly the same uh, as PHP, uh, the core of PHP takes care of a lot of details and, and, and the bridge between the language itself and, and the web server, but still, it's about standardizing uh, the HTTP protocol and the way we interact with the HTTP protocol. And the Symfony HTTP kernel components uh, provides the building block to create uh, flexible, extensible, and scalable HTTP-based frameworks. So, HTTP Foundation is about the representation of HTTP messages um, as defined in the HTTP specification. And HTTP kernel is um, the dynamic part of the specification. It gives the developer a standard way to under a request, do something about the request, and um, ensure that the response is sent back to uh, the browser. And the most important file class interface in Symfony and the HTTP kernel component is probably the in HTTP kernel interface. It's a very simple one, uh, one method, handle. It takes a request and as an argument. You need to implement it, and then you need to return a response at the end. Um, and just because of this one method, all the projects using HTTP kernel are interoperable, and you can, you know, um, create bridges between them. So let's see how it works in practice. So if you have a look at Drupal, uh, the Symfony full stack framework, Easy Publish, or, and a bunch of other ones, you will see something like that. We create an HTTP kernel, whatever it is. It is just a kernel implement, implementing the HTTP kernel interface. You create a request from the global variables, and you ask the kernel to handle the request, and then you send the response back to the browser. It is that simple. But just because you are using this pattern, it means that a lot of things become really easier. And one of the biggest problems when using plain PHP for um, HTTP is that the code is barely testable. But thanks to the HTTP kernel interface, it becomes really easy to write functional tests. And in the HTTP kernel uh, component, we have a client class. So the client class simulates a browser, really. So you pass it a kernel, and then you can simulate requests. Here, I want to simulate a get slash hello slash Fabian request. Then you can get the response, and you can check whatever you want on the response. Here, I'm... Um, I'm uh, checking that the status code is actually 200. But there is more. If you have access to the CSS selector component I've talked about before, you can filter, so actually the request method return a crawler. The crawler is like jQuery uh, for PHP, and then you can filter the response with a CSS selector, and then do whatever you want with the nodes. So here I'm checking that there is one H1 a tag on the page containing Fabian, right? Really easy. Um, it also means if you are using HTTP kernel interface, it means that you can also leverage HTTP caching. Um, not going to talk about that because uh, I'm running out of time here, but um, most of the time, you know, the caching layer um, created on, um, on, you know, various CMSs and frameworks are um, proprietary, really. Uh, we reinvent the wheel. But if you have a look at the HTTP specification, you will see that you have everything you need to create a good caching strategy uh, written in the HTTP specification. So, the HTTP specification defines two different caching models, expiration and validation. Expiration allows you to specify how long a response should be uh, considered fresh, 
Um, and validation is a bit more complex, and it needs that every time the server actually validates that the cache is still uh, valid. And the great thing is that you can still use uh, exploration and validation in the same request, meaning that you can say, okay, this re response uh, can be um, cached for 10 seconds, for instance, and every 10 seconds we validate that the cache is still fresh. So you can mix and match, and exploration always wins over um, validation. So the goal of um, a good HTTP caching strategy is to never ever generate the same response twice. Um, so as everything is based on HTTP, it means that setting the HTTP caching strategy is just um, as simple as setting some headers on the HTTP response. Uh, but we also provide an abstraction uh, for the most uh, common cases, like setting a TTL, uh, which is a way to say, I want to uh, expire this page in 10 seconds, for instance. Um, and even if when using the HTTP validation model, you can also uh, save some CPU by not generating the whole response, if you are able to actually say that the response is not modified, um, with, so this is kind of what you need to write to um, check that the response is always the same. You can return a 304 as fast as possible without generating the, the whole response. Um, and using the HTTP cache layer in Symfony is really simple. You can just wrap your kernel uh, with the HTTP cache um, class and the store is where you want to store the cache. That's really easy. And as we are leveraging HTTP and the HTTP cache headers, it means that instead of using the HTTP cache class, which is really just an implementation of a reverse proxy written in PHP, uh, you can also use uh, any reverse proxy, um, like Varnish, for instance. So if you are using Varnish, then your application is going to scale even better because the cache, the cache layer is going to be uh, handled by uh, Varnish, which, which is really fast. Um, and so in Drupal, you are not only using the HTTP kernel interface, you are also using um, the HTTP kernel, the default HTTP kernel implementation. And it's even better because we provide uh, a bunch, a workflow uh, from the request to the response where you can hook in and do stuff, do interesting stuff. Again, uh, I'm not going to talk about this workflow in great details because you can find a lot of information online, uh, a lot of um, documentation, videos, whatever. So if you want to know more, there are plenty of documentation online. Um, but the thing is, as this is standardized, uh, again, you will be able to leverage a bunch of um, features that comes built in with the HTTP kernel component. Last but not the least, um, we also support edge side includes ESI. And supporting ESI is only possible because we are able to actually handle more than one request and generate more than one response in one PHP process. So um, Drupal 8 is not um, able to handle ESI tags yet uh, because of technical problems because we are not, it's not uh, finished yet. But the goal is to be able to use ESI in, in, uh, uh, in, in Drupal 8 also. I also want to talk about predictability and that's something really important. And when you choose uh, Symfony for your open source project, it's not just about the code. Um, it's also about the way we manage the project in a very predictable way. Uh, and that's also a big plus. Of course, uh, as you are embedding uh, a third party um, code, it means that from time to time you need to upgrade, you need to update the code to the latest version. So being able to um, know when a new release is going to happen can help a lot. And we have a clear roadmap uh, that you can easily uh, follow. So there is a new Symfony release every six months, no matter what. Every six months at the end of November and May, we have a new release. And we have a new long-term support release every two years. Uh, a long-term support release uh, comes with three years of maintenance and four years 
of security issue fixes. Um, and we work out uh, to keep backward compatibility uh, between all the major releases. As an example, if you have a look at Twig, we released um, Twig version 1.0 uh, a year and a half ago, two years and a half ago, um, and we did not break backward compatibility since then. So in two years and a half, with more than, I think, 36 releases, we did not break backward compatibility. That's something really important for us because we know that a lot of different open source projects actually rely on our code, so we can't break backward compatibility because if we do that, we are going to break a bunch of uh, code. Um, talking about security issues also, uh, we have very well defined an open process. Um, so we work closely with uh, the Drupal security team um, to synchronize um, uh, our security releases. That, that's not happening right now, but it's going to happen when um, the stable version of Drupal is going to be released. So those are just example of what we do to ease the work of our users, um, be they big companies or open source projects. I want to finish my talk with uh, my take on, on Drupal 8 and, and the current situation of Drupal 8. Um, I'm an outsider here, um, so please uh, take my words with a grain of salt. I'm aware of the re recent uh, Drupal fork. Um, I've talked with Nate uh, just before this talk. Um, I'm aware that some people don't like Symfony. I'm aware that you struggle with a lot of things. Um, but I'm pretty sure that most of the problems that you have now are not really related to Symfony, um, uh, but more about how you are using Symfony and or how you are transitioning from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. And the good news is that I'm convinced that the vast majority of uh, the problems you have are fixable. I'm not saying that it's not it, 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 it's it's going to be easy. I'm not. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's going to take time, but it's still doable. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that you won't uh, regret that move um, in a year or two. And of course, if you need help, and I think you need help, uh, we are here to help. The Symphony community is here to help. So <clears throat> we want Drupal 8 to be a huge success. We need Drupal 8 to be a huge success. So let me show you my experience and my vision about you know, the current programming world and, and the state of things in PHP. Um, I think you know, developers um, need to embrace changes because the web evolves at a very fast pace. And you know, if you don't want to learn new things, if you don't want to adapt yourself to the new way of doing things, if you don't want to learn um, how things work in um, other technologies, in other languages. Um, if you don't want to reinvent yourself on a regular basis, I think that you, know, you, you really need to uh, look for another job. But at the same time, embracing changes is really hard, and that's the real challenge. And there is a pattern I've seen often in the last few years, um, and you know, it, it all starts when you discover a new way of doing something. Um, you discover a new pattern, a new best practice. And you start using it to solve one problem. And you find it beautiful, powerful, or just better than the other, uh, the other way. Um, you don't really understand why, but you have this feeling that you, um, you've just got to the next level, really. And then, all of a sudden, you want to use it everywhere. And it soon becomes you know, the way to fix all problems. But at some point, you realize that it's not the silver bullet. It does not help fixing uh, all the problems you have. Um, it's like, you know, I have two kids, and when I come back from a conference, most of the time, uh, I have a small gift for them. So they have this new toy, and it, it's great, it's, it, it's wonderful, and they want to play 
with this new toy. And all the old ones, ah, they are not, you know, so old, obsolete. And it lasts for two or three days a week, depending on, on, on the toy. And at some point, they realize that the new toy is great, but the old ones are also great. So they start using and, and playing with all their toys. I think this is the exact same thing here. Um, so, and here I'm talking about object-oriented programming, I'm talking about the MVC pattern, I'm talking about dependency injection, uh, I'm talking about all the new programming concepts introduced in um, Drupal 8. And all those new concepts are not the answers to all the problems, far from it. I'm even going to say that um, using them everywhere in Drupal 8 is a mistake. Would be a mistake, actually. Uh, it would be really bad for Drupal. So you need to find the right balance between a beautiful design and a practical one. And that's really tough. You need to understand when to use the new tools you have at your disposal. Um, you need to be able to migrate one step at a time to be sure that you don't overdo things um, and to be sure that you don't rewrite everything in one go. And knowing when to stop the refactoring, understanding where to apply um, this pattern is really hard. It probably took us, the Symphony community, about two years um, to really understand when and how to use dependency injection, uh, when to use the container in Symfony, when to inject the container, when not to inject the container. We even removed some of the features that we added in the container at some point because we realized that even if it was a good idea in the Java world, it did not make any sense in the PHP world, but it takes time. And that's some knowledge that we have, and, and we want to share that with you. Um, and, you know, using some PHP functions, that's fine. No big deal. Not a problem. And if you want to replace all the functions with static method calls, hmm, I think that's not a good idea. Doesn't make really sense. Not always, actually. Uh, creating a class without an interface, that's fine, even if a lot of people are going to tell you the contrary. Hey, we are using PHP, right? PHP is probably the worst language ever created. Right? So, if you are serious about programming anyway, use Java, use Lisp, but not PHP. Right? We are using PHP because it's the best way for us to get the job done. Right? Um, and we don't code for the code. Right? Coding for the code is really a bad idea. We code because we want to solve problems. We are coding to simplify people's life. Right? Um, and Symfony is just a set of tools. Symfony is not Drupal 8. I would even say that for most people, Symfony should be hidden. This is just an implementation detail. Uh, Symfony solves the low-level architecture of Drupal, um, and it should simplify the life of core developers, but it should not get in the way of regular uh, Drupal developers. And in the next coming month, we need to work together to find this right balance. Uh, and again, we are here to share our experience. We are here to help. Um, that's all for today. Thank you.